as a technology that's going to change the way the world thinks about and does embedded security. So, in layman's terms, we make antivirus, if you will, quote unquote, for, for every device. And we really mean every device, not some device, every device. Okay. Um, this, is, uh, the, this is what I call the software symbiote. Um, here's some really bold claims that I'm not going to back up uh, any, any of it, but you should believe that it does work. So, the symbiote can be injected into any embedded device. Okay? It'll work inside any operating system and it'll run on top of any ISA. And we require no source code. We work purely at the binary level. Um, and it is post-based defense for whatever operating system, whatever environment that the symbiote lives in without knowing at all what that operating system is. So this is six years of my PhD work. Um, we really do mean any operating system, any device. But if you want, you can read the papers that, that we put out describing how the symbiote works. Instead, I think I want to talk about, with the seven minutes that I, that I have, um, a, a story about the offensive work that I've done in terms of looking at embedded device security over the last few years. Uh, and I want to start with this guy. Do you guys recognize this? How many of you guys have one of these in your home, in your office? Right, it's a printer, it's an HP printer, laser jet. Uh, I, I, Sal and I were talking at Columbia and we decided to really look inside what, a, what, what, what is a printer, what's inside, how, how secure is it really, and what are fun things that we can do with it. Uh, so I decided to have printers. And it turns out people have done this for a long time, right? So this is uh, Project Gunman. Um, this is the, uh, an IBM Selectric typewriter that was found inside the US Embassy in Moscow in, I think, 1979, right? And when they found this thing, it has been in the embassy for over a, a decade, I think, at that point. And uh, somebody decided to x-ray the typewriter, and they found that somebody had replaced the undercarriage uh, bar right, of, of the typewriter with a tiny little passive transmitter that logged every single key and transmitted it to a truck that was listening out on the street. So old school embedded exploitation, right? super cool. And it turns out it goes back even further than that. So Operation Engulf um, was an MI6 operation that I think happened in 1959. And, and there, an analog telephone was used to acoustically extract the keying of, of the cipher machine, of the telex machine, right? Because the telephone was placed right next to the telex machine that the operator used every single day. Uh, so this is nothing new, but I want to talk about what was possible with, instead of 1950s technology, 2013-14 technology in terms of uh, offensive work inside embedded devices. Do you guys remember this? Like, <laughs> right? Turn your printer into a Fleming death bomb. So that's probably what you read. Uh, that sort of was my work, but there was an original, more sober article about that, uh, which, you know, still devastating habitat, which sounds, sounds nice. But what we found was, um, we found a vulnerability inside every single laser jet printer, right, that allows the attacker to change the firmware just by printing documents to it. Now, I want you to, I want to talk about what we can really do with that, you know, once I compromise a printer, what is my end goal? What is the purpose of getting inside a printer? Is it to steal your Fandango tickets and, and your printouts? Or is it something bigger than that? Uh, and, you know, after the printer, we looked at phones, right? So this is not a black phone. It's also supposedly a secure phone. We looked at Cisco phones and we did find vulnerabilities across the board for every Cisco phone model that's, that's out on the market. And uh, after that, we also looked at a buy phone, so no surprise there. We found different but similar vulnerabilities, not technically, but in, in spirit. And we also figured out a way to turn an IP phone into a radio transmitter if I have time. I'd love to tell you about Fontana, but we probably don't have time. Um, so this is the stuff that really interests me, right? Embedded devices being compromised for what purpose. Uh, you know, these are devices we all know, right? Um, smart cameras, printers, phones, etc. Some other devices you may or may not thought, have thought about. The internet is a collection of embedded devices, right? Every time you tweet, it goes through two dozen embedded devices routers and switches all the way up to Twitter servers and comes back down again. And sometimes we also put missiles on these embedded devices and sometimes people hack those drones, right? All possible. So, you know, depending on who you ask, it's a big number, 25 billion devices by the end of 2015, right? Um, more than half of them are networked now, so, you know, that's, you can reach these devices all over the place um, as long as they're connected to the network. But none of them run a host-based defense. So all of these devices, are running, but we have no assurance that they're running the code that we think they're running. And that's a fundamental problem that uh, Revlon is uh, addressing. So take a deep breath. I, we're now in the post-PC threat environment. I'm not one for sort of uh, slogans, but I like this one, right? the post-PC threat environment. So we're not really worried about, I mean, we, we still are, but 
this sort of environment isn't concerned about you know your your Chrome vulnerability or what happens in your laptop. It's everything else around your your desktop and your laptop that that we care about. So in the olden days, right, this is what network security looked like. You had big bad internet. You had the firewall, right? Behind the firewall, you had your servers, your desktops, your laptops, and outside the firewall, right, is hacksworking. Sort of who's, who's a jerk who wants to get into your network and do bad things to you, right? And the way you did it was by going through around the firewall to get access to the servers, right? And once you get access, you get the general purpose server to do some things for, for you, the attacker. But if you pay attention, let's look at what's really on the network today, okay? You have printers and you have phones and you have all of these things that look like devices that you used to know, but they're really general purpose computers put into a plastic case, right? So, you know, I'll, I'll show an example of, of what, what's really inside a phone today. And the strategy now is instead of going after the general purpose server, I go after the printer, for example, using a resume. And instead of getting the printer to you know, send back print jobs that you're sending to the printer, what I do instead is I use the printer to recon the network using it as a pivot box to go after other embedded devices. Right? So I implant myself into everything on your network that's not a general purpose computer because those are things that you have no whole space defense on. You have no visibility into what those things are doing. So I can do whatever it is I want to those devices as long as I don't break them. You probably won't know that I am inside your, your devices. And once I'm in a well situation, I can use those embedded devices to go after the general purpose server. I wanted to, um, or have these devices sent back data to me, the attacker. Um, and we actually built this out, so this is not hypothetical. We have a three-minute video on our website, asop.reboolinsecurity.com, that does this entire attack in real time using vulnerabilities that we found over the last three years. So it starts with a resume, goes through printers, uh, the printer tunnels back out the firewall, the printer then recons the network, gets phones, the phones gets routers, and the routers does funny things. Right. So if, you, if you're interested, check that video out. Um, I want to talk about the details of how does one actually do this. It doesn't take a lot. Right? So if you think about the cost of engineering Project Gunman, I mean, a lot of resources went into it. But Project Gunman version 2 really didn't take very much. It took two months of my time, uh, monkey soldering, duct tape, and an Arduino. And that essentially was how we pulled that project off. Uh, but here, this is a, the consequence of that, that research. HP released something like 63 firmware updates for every single uh, model of HP printer that they made. Now, did you guys go out and update the firmware on your printers? Anyone? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> How do you know? Are you sure? You should, you should probably do that. <laughs> and let's talk about the phone, right? So this is, you know, not, if you look at it, the, uh, the security manual, right, you will believe that this one is designed to be a secure phone. So it has a lot of the features that we've been talking about. It has FIPS, and, uh, FIPS certified crypto, it has signature verification with asymmetric crypto, it has a secure operating system, whatever that is, right? Secure OS. It also runs Java. Uh, <laughs> um, and it has a minimal attack surface and all this good stuff. And, you know, this is actually being used in really secure environments like President Obama says, lots of places in, in the government, financial sector, blah, blah, blah. Um, but what is it really, right? It's not really a phone, it's a general purpose computer in a plastic case, so let's break it down. I don't have as fancy of a, a thing diagram, right? but, but this is what it really looks like. There is a SOC, which is basically a processor. It's attached to some RAM, and it has some flash, right? and it's hooked up to the network. You put a microphone on it and a little switch, and that makes the thing a, a phone. But it turns out the switch is really no longer a switch. It's a general purpose pin controlled by software. So through that, we were able to compromise the switch right, and, and trigger an off-hook event uh, using the software. So what does that mean? At the end of the day, we can pull microphone data out of the phone when sitting on your desk doing nothing at all. And we actually have a, a couple of these in our office, and the audio quality is really good uh, for, <laughs> for having the microphone being pressed against a piece of plastic. Right? So uh, surprisingly good, actually. So what's my point? If you look at these vulnerabilities, you know, you can have all the crypto you want, you can have, you know, features that do secure things, but at the end of the day, you really need to go out and secure the endpoint, okay? And how do you do that? You can't just wait for the vendor to go out and fix the vulnerabilities that are disclosed because I didn't have to disclose the vulnerabilities that I found on the phone. I could have used it and kept it a secret, right? So patching is inherently a reactive thing to do. You need post-based defense, just like Back in the day, you had Windows XP, you put antivirus on your laptop or your desktop because that was a good thing to do. 
and I don't think that embedded space is any different, we should have host-based defense that runs on these embedded devices that assures us that at least you know, we're running the firmware that we think we're running, and somebody hasn't tampered with it uh, at runtime. And also, you know, truth in advertising, we're here to recruit. Uh, we have a lot of really exciting work, so if you like this sort of thing, please join Revolut. Um, this is the kind of stuff we do. We do cool things that are horrible hardware, or you know, awesome things, or, or terrible things that great hardware, depends on how you look at it. Uh, we give cool talks um, at places, and we're also scientists at heart, so we publish you know, our, our findings at top tier security conferences uh, in academia. And uh, here's the management team. My co-founder is also a back over there. Calvin is here, uh, and our technical research scientists, Jaden and I, I think Zach, ducked out. Uh, so that's us. That's my presentation. Questions? So, uh, to do you want to let somebody else have the floor? Uh, mining audio. So you now you're collecting audio. Did yeah. you do anything with mining it, like hoping that people would say interesting things, like credit yeah, card so numbers? Uh, and, and do that automatically, by the way, not having people sit around for 15 cents an hour listening absolutely. to the Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to say yes, I've done that, because no, I haven't done that. But we thought about the possibility. So the original question was, <laughs> have, we, have we been able to mine audio uh, from the output that we got from these sort of exploitation, right? Um, and it turns out, so the, the very first demo on the Cisco phone, we did voice exfiltration, right? We actually funneled that to Google Voice and did translation, and then we had, you know, grep through patterns of things that you shouldn't be saying. But on the Avaya phone, it turns out that these processors are, get, are getting so powerful that we, we could actually do uh, real-time speech-to-text right on the phone. So we were able to just bypass right, all of the Google stuff, and we tweet from the phone the things that you're saying. So, yes, absolutely. So you could, you could mine, so basically you're saying you could mine, actually, put on Someone the phone, can, yeah. Avaya phone and mine directly with this processor. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and if you want to go, you know, one step forward, further, we thought about this, or someone else thought about this, right? What you can do is you can, you can encrypt, right, uh, the audio, post the, the the text transcript publicly, right, and have that person pay you to take the, the transcript off before. Otherwise, you release the audio portion of it, right? Publicly. So, I'll put it somewhere. I'll put it more nefarious idea. Yeah, that's a good idea. This is, this is stupid. But did you work with short tail phones at all? Uh, no, I think someone else did it. Summer time. Right? Yeah. Well, I only mentioned because um, they're renowned for having terrible sound quality on the microphone and so the speakers. So okay. Uh, I was just wondering if that ever that factored at all with um, hacking. <laughs> 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 but I, I, I had audio quality. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do have to say that the, the audio quality in the bios and the Cisco's are really great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Somebody else can raise it, so I'll go for the staff. I've been hearing a lot of buzz about uh, something like software defined networks, which used to be something for voice. But now it's this idea that we're going to get rid of all these special purpose boxes floating around, like F5s and blue codes and Cisco routers and Cisco switches. We're just going to have a bunch of computers and you can throw some software in them and it's a switch, it's a load balancer, it's a food processor. Any thoughts about it's a whole other class of essentially like similar to the devices that you were discussing, and what kinds of uh, security would be necessary for that class, of that kind of yeah, I think absolutely. Well, if you say someone's going to replace Cisco routers, I, I mean, Ninja Force will strike them down <laughs> and make them disappear. Nobody's ever getting rid of Cisco routers, right? But uh, you know, the more general purpose these, these this hardware becomes, the more capable these things are. Right, that makes the software developer, easy, you know, their life easier, but it also makes the attacker's life a lot easier. Right, so I'll give you an example. You know, for example, the, the Cisco phone that we're done, fairly special purpose hardware. Right, but on the Avaya phone, we're, we're working with a well-known operating system, uh, really open hardware, things that I can look up, um, and that made the exploitation process so much easier. Right, and also now that I have more capability on the processor, I can do real-time speech to text and all this other fun stuff. Uh, it makes both the defender and, well, the engineer's life easier and also the attacker's life easier as well. Right? So the lesson really is you need host-based defense on these devices. 